Today on The Prosecutors, the case against Adnan Syed. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my unconquerable co-host, Alice. Hi, Brett. I am Hi, shaking in my boots, figuratively right now, because every Texan has a pair of good boots. Mm, it's true. Because... We are conquering a case that I really never thought we would have the time or energy to do. But thanks to doing all of these episodes live, I feel like invigorated to be doing this last episode, despite it coming with a lot of emotion. Because, as you know, we've talked about how these cases are kind of like our babies. And then we spend so much time with them and then we have to let them out into the world and let them, you know, criticize us all they want. It's true. I mean, you know how your children are when they become teenagers, and we're at 14 here. Possibly 15, depending on some things that may or may not come together at some point. But either way, we are in our teens here in this episode. And yeah, I know there were times where it felt like, for the people listening out there, we might never get here. There are some of you who are so glad we are here. So we will talk about something, anything other than Ed non sad. And some of you are probably sad to see it go. I personally didn't really, you know, wasn't really excited about covering this case. We talked about this. We talked about this at the beginning, but I've actually really enjoyed it. It turned out to be a lot of fun. So to all of you who said, cover this case, need to look into this case. Thank you for suggesting it because I actually really enjoyed it. And, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time on it today. This could be a long episode because we've got a lot to say. And then we've got like, this long list of things we want to discuss. At the end. So there's really no telling how long this is going to last. <laughs> so I hope you it, guys. It's kind of, it's it's literally a laundry list of like brain dump. <laughs> you know, it didn't yeah, fit it really well is. into the narrative, but it's like things I got to say. Yeah. Things we want to talk about at the end. And we're going to do that. And hopefully you guys will enjoy this. And look, we've tried to approach this case from an open mind. We've tried to give you guys the facts. Obviously we have offered our opinions. I think that's why you listen. I don't think you listen to us just recite things from the case file. You can read that. If you go to our website, prosecutorspodcast.com and go to the first episode, and I'll probably go ahead and put it all in this episode too, just so it's easy to find. We've linked to a whole bunch of stuff. We've uploaded a bunch of documents, check it out, read it for yourself. We always say, go to the original, the originals, you may have a different take on things than we do. You may read something in the file that we didn't even address that you actually think is really important. And I think it's important. You guys are all really smart. And, you know, it's like when my last trial, I did the closing. And one of the things I said in it was, you know, jurors, we don't pick juries of judges and lawyers. We pick juries who are going to decide the facts based on something much more important, which is their own common sense. And all of you have that, and all of you are qualified to think about these cases and reach conclusions based on the facts. Don't let anybody tell you what to think. Don't let anybody tell you what to listen to. And don't assume just because you're hearing it from us or hearing it from somebody else that it's the gospel and it can never be questioned. Feel free to question everything. Look for yourself. Read for yourself. Believe in your own ability to sift through this stuff. You can do it. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And, and, you know, a lot of times it's not worth doing, frankly, but you can do it. And we are going to do our best to make the resources available for you so you can do it. With that, are you ready to start talking, Alice? No, I'm ready. Okay, so up to this point, we've gone through a lot of evidence, obviously in the first 12 episodes. The last episode, we talked about some theories. There's one thing I want to come back to because it's been bugging me, and that's the the cell phone evidence in this case. And I had a, an oral argument this week, and I had this defense attorney. He was making this point, and his point was obviously wrong, but explaining why it was wrong on the fly was really hard. <laughs> And I kept trying to think of a way to explain this to the judge in a way that made sense and was convincing. And who knows if I was successful or not. We'll find out later whether or not I'm going to win that one. But that made me think about the cell phone evidence some more. So I want to come back to it very briefly, and then we'll talk some more about theories. One big thing about the cell phones. All of you know about the cover sheet. We talked about the cover sheet. And when you discuss the cover sheet, the cover sheet was the way to interpret the subscriber data, the subscriber data sheets. 
And you had these two documents and they both were important and they both were described as subscriber data. So you had this, this expert talking about them and he's going through how the, the things in the key are really on one of the documents and not on the other. And so it was his opinion, the key really applies to that first document and not so much the second. And at the end of the day, the judge, who I don't really think understood the distinction he was trying to make, basically said, ah, I don't know. They both say the same thing. They both say they're subscriber data sheets. So I think the key applies to both. The key says you can't trust location data. So I don't think you can trust location data. That's essentially what the judge said. Eventually, that turned out not to matter because of some procedural things that became problematic. And so that issue kind of died away. But for those of us who are trying to figure out the truth here, I think it is important. And there's one thing I want to note, and you may buy this, you may not buy it. But when I was thinking about this, um, when you look at that key, it says that the location data is not reliable for incoming calls. And as we pointed out in our episode, there is a column for location. And it was the FBI agent's position, and I think we basically endorsed it, that when it says location data is not reliable for incoming calls, it is probably applying to the location column. But plenty of people look at that and say, well, yeah, but why wouldn't that apply with equal force to the location data from the cell site analysis? And there's just one thing I want to point out. We are all using shorthand to describe cell site analysis. We are describing that information as location because that's why it's important to us. We want to use it to find the information, but that is not the information that the document conveys. The information the document is conveying is the cell tower and the cell sector that the cell phone is connecting with. The only way you get location out of that is to take additional information that you know, including the way cell phones work, the length of coverage, the, the amount of coverage that each tower has, the sectors that the towers are divided into, what areas those sectors cover, use some math, use some geometry, and then you reach location. So to me, when you read that where it says not accurate for location data, it doesn't say not accurate for cell site analysis, not accurate for cell towers and the sectors the cell phone is pinging for incoming calls. And I think that's important. And I think it's something that people miss when they look at the cell, the cell information in isolation and don't think about a little bit deeper about what it's really saying. Brett, that's a really, really good point. <clears throat> and for those of you who might need like a picture or a metaphor of what Brett just explained, it would make sense that if you were given a math problem and someone just wrote a number on the page, the answer to number one is 83. That is the that's analogous to the location column, right? It doesn't tell you how it reached the location. It literally just gives you an answer. 83 on the math problem. What it's not saying is when you do the entire math proof with all the inputs that have no reason to doubt, you have no reason to doubt the other things. Nothing on that subscriber sheet says the inputs into the analysis should be questioned, that you can't put together what basically the subscriber sheet does not doubt the accuracy of to do your own math and your own math proof and arrive at the answer. And so if the answer ends up being the same as 83, that there's no indication on the subscriber sheet that should doubt that analysis that reaches that answer. So just wanted to add that you guys can take it for what it's worth. Cell phone stuff is obviously it's complicated, it's confusing and it's controversial but I do think it's helpful. And as we always note, really only controversial when it comes to these incoming calls. So, all right, with that. So with that, I mean, what are we that, all here for? What are we all here yeah. for, Brett? We are here to talk about how Adnan is innocent. And I think this is very important to talk about because obviously there are really two camps, right? Either Adnan did it or Adnan did not do it. We did not come into this case with any sort of predetermined reason. I had listened to Serial. I had read kind of news updates, you know, throughout the years about the case, but I had never dived into the records. So I wasn't in some camp of absolutely 1000% sure I know that Adnan is guilty or innocent. And I think it's important every case, and we do this in our cases, and we're asked about this from you guys. How do we check our biases? You do that by making the case for both sides. So let's talk about the case for Adnan's innocence. So what is the argument for that? First, 
the timeline, as we have said over and over, is extremely tight. Even assuming the murder happened later than the prosecution said, Adnan needed to get Hay in the car, get away from Woodlawn, strangle her, and move her body to the trunk all in less than an hour. And he had to do this with no one seeing him, including no one at school. Did he have a motive? The prosecution pointed to a combination of things, religion and jealousy, as the prime motive. But the religion motive is a little all over the place. Yes, Adnan was religious, but he seemed like he wasn't exactly devout as a teenager. He lied to his parents, he smoked pot, he slept with girls, and he dated girls outside of his religion, including Hay and Nisha. And while, obvious, and while Adnan obviously liked Hay a lot, he, like her, had seemingly moved on. He was dating someone else, just like Hay was dating someone else. He, and it wasn't just that day that they started dating. They were dating people since about New Year's. It wasn't like Adnan was sitting at home, lonely, completely by his lonesome self, pining over Hay. And Adnan doesn't seem like the kind of person who kills over nothing. He's maintained a sterling record in prison. He has no history of violence. We know that at school, he was in the honors program. He was a good student. He was driven. And yes, he smoked pot, but that isn't exactly unusual and is barely a crime these days anyway. And other than that, he was a seemingly great kid a good student, at least when he turned in his assignments and showed up for class. He was an athlete. He was popular with his classmates, popular with his whole school, winning school-wide titles. He was prom prince. It's safe to say that few at Woodlawn thought Adnan did this. And even if they initially did, time and public attention have turned many, if not most of them, to his side, even some who testified at his trial. Then there's the things we've discussed throughout this podcast. The chief evidence against Adnan is Jay. And Jay's story changes. And it changes in key ways. Sometimes Jay lies outright. Sometimes he conflates or confuses things. Can Jay be trusted? And even if he can, is the lying enough to create reasonable doubt? There's also the lividity evidence that some have said shows Hay couldn't have been buried when she must have been if Adnan is the one responsible. There's the testimony of Asia McLean that Adnan was in the library when the prosecution said Adnan was killing Hay. And there's a Zol- uh, and there's Alonzo Sellers who doesn't make a bad suspect. And there's the question about the cell phone data, which we've talked about a lot. Can it really be used to show the location of the cell phone? And if the evidence against Adnan doesn't stand up, how can we really know and say that he's guilty and guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? Well, I guess that's it. (laughs) Good job, Alice. Alice did a great job laying out the case for Adnan's innocence. And I think a lot of the things that Alice talked about are things that you hear a lot from a lot of people. And there are things that I think you do have to grapple with when you're talking about this case, particularly if you want to say that Adnan Syed killed Heyman Lee. Now, obviously you all have listened to the last 13 episodes. So, you know that we address these issues throughout the podcast. And in our opinion, many of the problems can be explained, but maybe you disagree. Maybe your take was different. Maybe you still doubt the cell phones or you think the lividity evidence is powerful. Maybe you don't trust Jay or you think he's lying about some things or a lot of things, and that's fine. But we think we can all agree on at least one thing. None of this evidence is knocked down. Maybe the actual lividity on Hay doesn't match up with her burial, but the reality is the photographs we've seen and the frankly shoddy autopsy report are consistent with their burial. Maybe the location data for incoming calls is unreliable, but that's based on an instruction sheet that no one can really explain. 
one an ex one an FBI expert says isn't talking about cell sites, and current AT and T personnel say doesn't mean what the defense thinks it means. But still, we can't say for certain that the incoming calls were reliable any more than we can say for sure that the lividity evidence was absolutely consistent with the burial. The truth is there's not enough evidence to be definitive on either of these things. And since it's not Adnan's job to prove he's innocent, maybe that's enough. Maybe that's enough to conclude that it was the right and just thing for him to be released from prison. There's a problem. Brett, is that what you think, though? No, <laughs> that, that is that is not what I think, because despite all of those things, the case for Adnan's guilt is so strong. We started with some of the points that needed to hold up. That's how we began this entire podcast series. One, Adnan gave Jay his car and cell phone that day. Two, Adnan had Jay pick him up after the murders and drop off Hayes' car. Three, later, Adnan had Jay help him bury the body in Leakin Park. And four, Adnan and Jay dropped the car off in an alley between some apartments after the body was buried. The first is undisputed. Adnan and Jay were together most of the day. And that can't be denied, and I don't think most people would deny it. But what about the other three? Now, there are discrepancies in their stories, and those stories are certainly open to attack. But Jen Pusateri fingered Adnan for the murders with her lawyer present and told basically the same story that Jay would tell later that night to police. It was a story backed up by cell phone pings and the coincidence of Adnan letting Jay borrow his car and phone the very day of the murder. It was supported by the Nisha call, a call that smacks of an attempt to build an alibi that later backfired. This call proves that Adnan and Jay were together in the three o'clock hour at the exact time Jay said they were and at the exact time they would need to be together for Adnan to have killed Hay. Jay's story was supported by Jen's knowledge that Hay had been strangled, a fact that was not known to the public. It was supported by Adnan asking Hay for a ride the day of the murder for a fake reason and then lying about it later to the police. And it came only a few weeks after Hay not only broke up with Adnan, but quickly replaced him with somebody older and flashier. These are separate interlocking facts that do not depend on each other, all lining up to support the story in dispute. Even if some of these facts fall away or aren't entirely convincing to you, there are other facts to replace them. If this case weren't the subject of a smash hit podcast and international debate, it would be a slam dunk, the kind of case you wouldn't even bother to question. Just another example of a toxic relationship and a man who would rather kill a woman than be embarrassed by her. And I want to turn to Jay's statements because I know there is so much debate and so much talk about whether we can trust Jay. And a lot of people just throw up their hands despite overwhelming evidence of Adnan's guilt to say, well, got to throw out all of the strong evidence because Jay lies and how he has changed his story over time. But if you take Jen's story and Jay's, there is a basic story that emerges. Adnan called Jay, gave him his cell phone and car, called Jay later while he was at Jen's. Jay picked up Adnan at Best Buy. They dropped the car off at the park and ride. And then Jay dropped Adnan at track practice. Jay later picked up Adnan and they went to Christy Vincent's house. There, Adnan got a call from the cops and the two went back to get Hay's car and bury her body. Then Adnan dropped off Jay where he was picked up by Jen and went back to his house and possibly mosque. That's the basic story. Do the cell phone pings support it? Well, here's what they show in brief. At 10.45 a.m., there's an outgoing call from Adnan to Jay pinging at Woodlawn High School. At 12.07 p.m., Adnan's phone calls Jen Pusateri, not someone that Adnan knew well and not someone he would have called. 
spot Jen is Jay's best friend, confirming that at this point, Jay has Adnan's cell phone and car. At 12.41 p.m., another call to Jen, this time near Jay's grandmother's house. At 2.36 p.m., an incoming call to Adnan's cell phone in the wedge covering Jen's house. This call was the call the prosecution said was the come get me call, and it's more likely actually that the call Jay would later describe as the be ready call though it could also have been a call telling Jay to head towards the Best Buy where Adnan knew he was going. At 3.15 p.m., an incoming call covering Best Buy and the mall. At 3.21 p.m., outgoing call to Jen, which also pings the same tower covering Best Buy and the mall. Note that these two calls only six minutes apart, one incoming and one outgoing, ping the same tower. At 3.32 p.m., there's an outgoing call to Nisha Tana. This call, 11 minutes after the incoming call, and a butt dial or not, also pings the same tower and the same cell location. At 3.48, outgoing call to Phil with the cell phone moving into the A sector of the tower, away from the Best Buy and towards Woodlawn. At 3.59 p.m., an outgoing call to Patrick, which also pings the A sector of the Woodlawn Tower, which covers the school. At 4.12 p.m., the cell phone now calls Jen again, and this time pings around Jay's house. At 4.27 p.m., an incoming call pings the tower near Jen's house, pinging the cell quadrant to its west. At 4.58 p.m., an incoming call pinging the same tower near Jen's house. At 5.38 p.m., an outgoing call to Krista pinging the I-70 park and ride where Jay says Adnan left Hay's car earlier and is in the direction one would travel from Woodlawn to Christy Vincent's house. At 6.07, an incoming call with the cell phone pinging the quadrant that covers Christy's house. At 6.09, an incoming call which pings a different tower, but still one covering Christy's house. At 6.24, an incoming call from Officer Adcock, which pings the same tower as the 6.09 call also covering Christie's house. There's one thing I want to say about this call. As we talked about when we went through the timeline, one of the problems with the incoming calls is we don't know who it's from. So it's difficult, for instance, because you don't know who it's from, to test the defense theory about why incoming calls are inconsistent. And I want to remind you of what the expert Jerry Grant said, testified to in trial. Here's what he said when he was asked, why would incoming calls be, be less reliable for location data? And he says, I'm aware of testimony that in earlier days, and it was from an AT&T, I believe, I don't know if it was an engineer or a person working from AT&T, that there's a possibility that an incoming call in earlier years would reflect the location of the caller and not the person being called because they were both AT&T customers. The advantage of this call is we know exactly who it was and we know exactly where they were. This is Officer Adcock. He is calling from far north. He's calling much closer to Hayes' house where he's been. He would not have been near Christie's house. He would not have been where the cell phone ping tells us the cell phone was at the time. The only person who would have been there is Adnan, which is consistent both with the prior calls and with the story the J told. At 6.59 and at 7, there are two outgoing calls, one to Yasir Ali, Adnan's friend, and another to Jen's pager. At this point, the cell phone is now pinging the tower that covers Woodlawn High. Note that at this late hour, the cell phone is calling one person that Adnan knew, but Jay didn't, and one person that Jay knows, that Adnan barely knows, indicating that they are still together. At 7.09 and 7.16, there are two incoming calls that ping the tower covering three key spots. 
the park and ride where the car was left, the burial spot, and the ultimate location of Hay's car. This is the only time that day that the phone pings that tower and that sector. And the only other time it pings that tower and sector is on a later day when Jay is arrested for an unrelated charge, when Adnan makes an outgoing call to Patrick, one of Jay's friends. At 8.04 p.m., an outgoing call is made to Jen's pager. This outgoing call, which no one disputes is accurate, is pinging the sector covering where Hay's car will be found. This tower has coverage of the car dump location, though not the other important spots like the park and ride or the burial site, indicating the cell phone has moved away from the burial site to the car location. At 8.05, an outgoing call is made to Jen's pager. This call is now in the sector west of the car dump location, indicating the cell phone is moving away from that location and towards where Jen will pick up Jay. 9.01 p.m. The next call is an outgoing call made almost an hour later. It's Tunisia, and it's pinging the tower and sector covering Adnan's home. So that is a summary of what the cell phone pings tell us. And it maps on incredibly well to the basic story that we know emerges between Jay and Jen's story. And though we've talked about how Jay's story changes or he lies at times, we have talked in detail about how it is very unlikely for Jen to have been lying. She was there talking to the police with her mother and an attorney there. She knew things that she didn't know how it fit into the big picture of Adnan and Jay's story. And everything she was being told was told to her secondhand by Jay. And I think it's incredibly important to note just yet again that Jen and Jay were best friends. They hung out just about every day, playing video games at Jen's house. They were really connected at the hip, it seemed. Adnan and Jen, not so much. They didn't have that type of relationship. They barely knew each other. And as far as we know, they really didn't hang out together at all, especially because. Jay and Adnan claim they didn't hang out that much with each other. <clears throat> so the cell phone pings, there are a lot of them, and they're consistent with the general story told by Jay and Jen. Now look, the times don't always match, and there are some ancillary details that are probably wrong, side trips that clearly didn't happen, at least the way we were told, or on the day they were suggested. And this is real life. This is a real life case. It's not a movie. There are Chekhov's guns in real life. Just because a gun shows up in the first act in real life doesn't mean it's going to go off. And there are always going to be things in the story that don't fit and that you won't know. And this is certainly one of those cases. You will never know everything that happened that day. And you will never know every single step that Jay and Jen and Adnan took. But what I think we can say for certain is the cell phone is everywhere it needs to be when it needs to be there for Jay's story to work. We don't see random pings all over the city of Baltimore. We see outgoing calls and incoming calls that are near in time pinging the same towers. We see calls, the timing of which perfectly fits the burial story. The cell phone goes from Woodlawn to Jay's grandmother's to Jen's to the Best Buy, back to Woodlawn, down to Christie's, up to the burial site, over to the car dump location, back towards the mall where Jen picked up Jay, and then back to Adnan's house at exactly the time you would expect. So did Adnan do it? Or is it a coincidence? Or do the calls match because the police fed Jen and Jay the story to make it match. Then there's Adnan and Hay's car. We spent a lot of time on whether Adnan asked Hay for a ride that day, but a funny thing has happened over the last 20 years. Even though Adnan's story hasn't changed, it seems that most of his supporters don't believe him. No one seems to believe that Adnan did not ask Hay for a ride on January 13th. Some speculate that it was a short trip. 
Adnan just wanted Hay to give him a short ride around the school property, as she'd often done, so he wouldn't have to walk down to the football field for practice. Again, to not have to walk that distance to go track practice is just something I have to kind of chuckle at a little bit. Adnan doesn't like to walk. He does not like to walk. We've already covered this in detail before. There's another explanation that Adnan asked for a ride but never took it because Hay backed out. As we said back in our episode discussing the events of January 13th, one of Adnan and Hay's mutual friends, Becky, would tell police that she overheard Hay tell Adnan she couldn't give him a ride after all because she had something to do. We initially said that Becky didn't testify about this at trial, but she kind of did. Though what she said isn't as straightforward as what she told the police. At trial, Becky only said that Hay had plans that day. But Hay didn't tell Becky what those plans were. They could have been meeting Adnan. But what Becky didn't testify to is that Hay couldn't take Adnan somewhere because of her plans, whatever they were. This is interesting, though the story that Hay told Adnan she couldn't drive him has been bolstered by Aisha, who many years later would recall telling Krista the same thing on a telephone call after Hay went missing. But here's the problem. The one person who's never said any of this is Adnan. And in fact, the night of Hay's disappearance, he told Officer Adcock, that Hay was supposed to give him a ride, but that by the time he arrived at the designated spot, she was gone. If Hay had told him that very day that she couldn't take him somewhere, why didn't he tell Adcock that? Wouldn't that have been a pertinent piece of information to tell a police officer when your very good friend had disappeared? And why did he change his story on February 1st and tell a different officer that he didn't ask Hay for a ride at all, a story that he has stuck to all these years. The timeline here is instructive, and we want to give a shout out, and I'm being absolutely sincere in this, to Just Wondering If, who is a Reddit poster, for helping us out on this. If you want to take a look at this yourself, it's on the Adnan Syed subreddit. According to Krista, and I believe this is from her appearance on Bob Ruff's show, she found out that afternoon the afternoon Hay was missing, she finds out that she's missing, and she calls Aisha, or Aisha calls her. She doesn't remember who makes the call, but she knows they talked. And either way, Krista tells Aisha in this conversation, and this is what she said. Okay, well, you know, Adnan was supposed to get a ride from her or whatever. Has anybody checked with him? At 6.07, young Lee calls Adnan with a number he thinks is Don's number. At around the same time, Aisha is speaking to Officer Adcock and relays to him what Krista has told her. Adnan was supposed to get a ride from Hay. At 6.09, Adnan gets an incoming call. We cannot know for sure who it's from, but it's widely believed that it is from Aisha telling Adnan that the police will contact him about Hay. This means two things. First, Adcock calling Adnan isn't a lark or a coincidence. He is calling Adnan because he already knows from Aisha that Adnan was supposed to get a ride from Hay. And two, Adnan knows that Adcock knows about the ride. In that moment, there's only one thing he can do. Admit that indeed he was supposed to get a ride from Hay. There are a couple possibilities about why he thought this was the only response he could give. The first is that Becky is mistaken about the day that Hay told Adnan she couldn't drive him. Becky's wrong, so that excuse wasn't available to Adnan. But the fact Adnan said what he did doesn't necessarily mean that Becky and Aisha are later wrong about what Hay told him. It may well be the case that Hay did tell Adnan she couldn't take him and Becky overheard him. But what it means for sure is that if that happened, Adnan wore her down eventually. If Hay had simply not given him a ride because she couldn't take him, Adnan would have said just that. It's an easy excuse, and it has the benefit of being true. But he didn't say that. There's only one reason that would be. In the moment, he panicked. 
He couldn't call Krista and Aisha a liar, and he couldn't deny the ride. He had to own it. If he would had more time to think or had smoked less pot that day or had been quicker on his feet, he could have said that Hay said she had something to do. But he didn't think to say that because that was an obstacle he'd already overcome. So he said he was supposed to get a ride with her, but she left without him. Later on, he would realize this was a huge mistake, one of the keys to his guilt. So he took the position from that point forward that this conversation never happened, that he never asked Hay for a ride at all. But by then, it was too late. And all these years later, even with his key supporters offering excuse after excuse about why he asked for the ride or what happened with it, he's been stuck with the story he told. That ride that Adnan asked for, the ride he's lied about for 20 years, the ride he told listeners of Serial he'd never ask for because Hay had to go get her cousin. Even though he'd been having sex with Hay in the Best Buy parking lot between school letting out and her picking up her cousin for months before they broke up. This is just one of the pieces of evidence you must discount to believe Adnan is innocent. And that brings us to where we typically end up. It comes down to what it often comes down to for us. What would you have to believe to believe that Adnan did not commit this crime? First, you'd have to believe that Jennifer Pusateri, who talked to police with her lawyer and mother present, either told a false story to protect Jay and frame Adnan, or was manipulated by the police, once again with her lawyer present, into telling the story they wanted to hear to frame Adnan, all, by the way, while possibly implicating herself in the crime. And the police did this to set up Jay to be the key witness in this entire scheme, even though at the time they talked to Jen, there's no evidence they even knew who Jay was. And if they did, what they would have known is that Jay was a drug-dealing black man with a record. And yet, you'd have to believe that in 1999, the Baltimore police, when they talked to Jen, they'd already decided to make Jay the linchpin of this entire framing scheme. You then have to believe that that very night, Jay either told the same false story to frame Adnan, or the police fed him the same story they'd given to Jen while she was in the presence of her attorney. If you believe the police are framing Adnan by using Jay, you'd also have to believe that the police would rather frame the top student, athlete, popular kid at the local magnet program, rather than framing the black, drug-dealing, hoodlum, who arguably has as much evidence against him as Adnan does, or even the streaking community college handyman who had found the body and failed a polygraph. You'd have to believe that the police correctly gambled that these two teenagers Jen and Jay could pull this frame job off and never come clean over the decades that followed, even with all the pressure to do so after Serial. You'd have to believe that all the outgoing calls on Adnan's phone and the incoming calls, many of which are made while Adnan and Jay are together and to people that one or the other of them know but are not known to the other, just so happen to match the locations you would expect them to be if Jay and Adnan were disposing of Hay's car and body, as Jay said, and just so happened to occur at the exact times necessary for Adnan to have murdered Hay and for this police conspiracy to come off. And that's not all you have to believe. To believe that the police are feeding a story to Jay to match the cell phone towers, you'd have to believe that police had that good and understanding of cell phone towers that early in the investigation. Not to mention that early into the history of cell site analysis itself. Despite evidence, the police were simultaneously asking AT&T for evidence they already had. But you'd also have to believe at the same time that they are incompetent enough to feed Jay an overly complicated story that doesn't fit the times and includes events that could not have happened. On the other hand, They're sophisticated manipulators, concocting the ultimate scheme to frame Adnan. On the other hand, 
I don't know how many hands you have. They're completely incompetent. Expecting Jay to be able to pull off this incredibly complicated story they've concocted rather than feeding him a simple, easy-to-remember story without all the complications of real life. Then there are the incoming calls that ping the Leakin Park Tower in precisely the time frame Jay and Jen say Jay and Adnan were burying Hay's body there. Even if you don't believe the FBI cast expert that incoming calls can be used to accurately locate a stationary cell phone, you'd have to believe that of all the towers in the city, the phone could coincidentally ping at the same the sorry. You'd have to believe that of all the towers in the city, the phone could coincidentally ping at that time. They ping the tower that would most incriminate Adnan, a tower that his phone pinged only one other time, the day Jay was picked up on an unrelated charge. And you'd have to believe that when the police spoke to Jay the first time, even though they lacked the cell phone location data at that time, they nevertheless concocted a story that would fit what that data later said, including the location and time of Hay's burial and the location and time of her car drop-off. Let's talk about the car. That Jay knew the location of the car is one of the biggest pieces of evidence against Adnan. I would go so far to say that if Jay had been struck by a bus on the way across the street to talk to the police for the first time, and his dying words were that Adnan did it and the location of the car, that would be enough. That's one reason Jay's inconsistencies are interesting, but not definitive. The location of the car is enough. To overcome Jay's knowledge of the car's location, you'd have to believe that the police, and not Jay, knew the location of Hayes' car and left it in the elements for days, weeks, or even more than a month, rather than taking the car into custody, processing it for the enormous amount of possible evidence it might contain, and then simply feeding the location where they'd, fi- where they'd found the car to Jay or some other witness at a later date. You'd have to believe that the police found the car after they found Hayes' body, or else you'd believe that they had the car while she was simply missing and did nothing with it for a month, on the off chance she was a murder victim and they could use it later on to frame someone. You'd have to believe that despite investing in this thoroughgoing frame job and having no compunctions about pinning a murder on an innocent man, rather than simply planting incriminating evidence against Adnan in the car while they had it, They instead depended on cell phone evidence they didn't really understand and had never really used before, and the story of a drug dealer to secure their conviction. And you'd have to believe that they knew enough about the cell phone location information at the time they first met Jay to plant the car in the precise place it would need to be to match up with the cell phone information they would later discover. Somehow, That day, or even earlier, the police knew that the cell site analysis would reveal that the cell phone pinged on January 13th over the very location the police would dump the car at the time that would make sense for the car to have been dumped there by Adnan and Jay. And they used this knowledge so Jay would get the car's location right. But despite taking this extreme step, they didn't use the other knowledge they had from the cell phone to ensure that the rest of Jay's first story perfectly lined up what the cell location data would later show. And you'd have to believe that this is one of, if not the most egregious examples of police misconduct in the history of policing. This is not tunnel vision or confirmation bias or withholding exculpatory evidence or planting a gun or some blood or some dope. This is a full-scale, coordinated scheme to frame Adnan, a 17-year-old boy with no particular notoriety. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, yes, but this is Baltimore, and one of the investigators in this case has been cited for misconduct before and had cases overturned before. Let's take a look at that allegation, because it's instructive, and we can look no further than the state's We can look no further than state attorney's motion to vacate Adnan's conviction for how it's described. In the Bryant case, and now I'm reading from the filing. In the Bryant case, 
It was alleged in the complaint that Detective Ritz failed to disclose exculpatory and impeachment evidence and fabricated evidence. More specifically, it was alleged that Detective Ritz, quote, obtained a misidentification of Mr. Bryant from Taisha Powell, the single eyewitness presented at trial. Detective Ritz failed to disclose evidence about a second eyewitness whose account contradicted and undermined Taisha Powell's. He also failed to disclose incriminating evidence pointing to the likely true perpetrator, John Doe, including a witness statement incriminating Doe and undermining his denials of culpability, and a composite sketch that more closely resembled Doe than Mr. Bryant. Plaintiffs claim that when Detective Ritz met with Mr. Ms. Powell and another detective to create a composite sketch of the suspect, Detective Ritz used direct or indirect suggestion to manipulate the composite sketch to make it more closely resemble the person he suspected, Malcolm Bryant. Plaintiffs also claim Detective Ritz showed Ms. Powell a suggestive photographic lineup consisting of six individuals, including Malcolm Bryant. In addition to the alleged misconduct during Ms. Powell's interview, plaintiffs claim Detective Ritz never interviewed or conducted any follow-up investigation regarding any of the individuals with whom Mr. Bryant had spent the evening of November 20th, who could have provided an alibi for him. Detective Ritz also allegedly failed to investigate other evidence of Bryant's whereabouts on the night of the murder. Additionally, plaintiffs allege Detective Ritz did not disclose to Mr. Bryant, Mr. Bryant's counsel, or the prosecutor some of the evidence he obtained that incriminated another suspect, and he did not conduct proper interviews about or of the suspect. Closing in on this last paragraph, Plaintiffs also allege the police received three 911 calls on the night of the murder, one of which was from a potential eyewitness whose account of the crime contradicted Ms. Powell's account. Plaintiffs claim Detective Ritz did not investigate this potential witness's report and never disclosed the report of the second potential eyewitness or the other 911 calls to Mr. Bryant, Mr. Bryant's counsel, or the prosecution. Plaintiffs also claim the defendants never tested critical items of evidence obtained from the crime scene for DNA, which would have exonerated Mr. Bryant. These are incredibly troubling allegations, but they are also believable in what they allege. Tunnel vision, confirmation bias, failure to turn over information, failure to investigate. When you see a police officer bungle an investigation, and we've covered those instances in past episodes, or even engage in corruption that leads to a false conviction. This is the pattern you see. But this kind of activity pales in comparison to the level of police misconduct you'd have to believe was at work here, one involving multiple homicide detectives as well as beat cops. Let's be clear here. It is not enough to believe that Jay was coached by the police. It is not enough to believe that the police used the cell phone evidence to tap, tap, tap their way to a more coherent, coherent story by Jay. It is not enough to believe police massaged the facts or gave Jay critical information or even planted evidence. Do not lie to yourself. You have to believe that the Baltimore police concocted this entire story with a plan to frame Adnan from the ground up to the extent of keeping the car hidden till the right minute and then feeding every single detail to both Jay and Jen to make sure the plan would work. They then used the unbelievable coincidence that Jay and Adnan were together the entire evening with the phone pinging in all the right places at all the right times to secure their story and the conviction and they used this, even though when they concocted the plan, they would have had no way to know what specific information the cell phone would tell them. That is what you must believe, every single piece of it. This would go far beyond coaching a witness. If Mark Furman planted a bloody glove on OJ's property to frame him, that conspiracy would pale in comparison to what would be necessary to frame Adnan. 
And if it's true, not only should Adnan be exonerated, Baltimore should be conducting a criminal investigation of every single officer involved in this case. And someone should not only be going to prison, but someone else should be making a Hollywood movie. The only problem is if that story I just told you were fiction, it would be too unbelievable to work. But they're not launching a full-scale investigation, and they won't, because no one really believes that's what happened. And the only alternative that makes sense is that Jay did it. But as we talked about in our last episode, he has no real motive, and because Adnan put himself with Jay for most of the evening, and the Nisha call puts Jay with him the only other time that matters, no opportunity to commit the crime either, unless he's helping Adnan do it. Adnan Syed was found guilty by a jury beyond any reasonable doubt for the murder of Heyman Lee. Perhaps one day there will be evidence that undermines that conviction and creates reasonable doubt for us. Maybe the touch DNA on Hay's shoes will come back to a serial killer working in the area. Or maybe, despite unprecedented focus on this case and an unprecedented effort to prove Adnan innocent, one fact keeps getting in the way. Adnan Syed is guilty. So that's our conclusion. We know you're not all going to agree with it, and that's fine. But I do. I want you to do one thing. This is not the only story that's been told about what happened that day. There are other stories that have been told, and some of them have been by people who deeply believe in Adnan Syed's innocence. On the website, prosecutorspodcast.com, we're going to include a link to Colin, Mir- to Colin Miller's theory about this case. I think he calls it the most likely scenario. It's the scenario he believes is most likely. He obviously believes Adnan is innocent. He is one of the hosts of Undisclosed. I think a better way to describe his theory is what had to happen if Adnan Syed is innocent. We're not going to go into it. I want you to read it for yourself. I want you to read the theory for yourself, knowing everything you know. I want, to com- I want you to compare it to what you've heard from us, and I want you to decide for yourself what you think is the most likely, most believable thing that happened that day is it the story the most likely story as as colin says or do you think it's something that has more to do with adnan's involvement now we have a lot of things we're going to talk about but one thing we promised you is our own theory i don't know if alice has has a a theory that she's developed i actually don't know what your theory is like in detail i mean we are on the same page that we believe Adnan is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but I actually don't know what your theory is. And I have thought a lot about this. So I'd like to hear yours. Okay. And I want to give it. (laughs) (laughs) Imagine that Brett. Yeah. And I've thought about this a lot about what I think happened. I said at the earlier, one of the earlier episodes, and I don't remember which one that I didn't actually think this was a premeditated murder that I thought this was a crime of passion. And I know a lot of people disagree with that. And one thing I want to say is I think when you try and draw some sort of hard and fast line between premeditated and a crime of passion, I think that's a mistake. I think there are elements of premeditation in this case, but I actually think it, the reason I think it's not premeditated is because I think Adnan had a false hope. And I think the false hope is what actually led to the murder in the first place. So let's go all the way back to the beginning and talk about what we know. We know that the night before Hay disappears, Adnan, she's on the phone with Don. Adnan is trying to call her, ostensibly to give give her his phone number. The other thing we know is that they had had this really passionate relationship. It was one that affected Adnan a lot. I don't think anybody denies that. They'd been broken up for about a month but really things had taken a turn in those days leading up to her death on christmas they're giving each other expensive gifts when hay gets to a car wreck she's not just calling don she's calling adnan to come down and take a look at it and i think even asking adnan for rides at that point but sometime but sometime about a week before there'd been a big change we talked so much about that aim profile and you guys may think this is funny but it's not that was a huge deal and it was indicative of a change in Hayes' mindset. It is quite possible that on Christmas of 1998, both Hay and Adnan thought they would get back together at some point. But I think by January 13th, Hay had moved on. I don't think 
Adnan had. And I think Adnan had a plan for the 13th. I think he planned to get into Hayes' car, and I think he intended to try and win her back. A lot of what I'm going to say here is obviously speculation. We'll never know the exact truth unless Adnan tells us one day, or unless it turns out that we're wrong, Adnan's innocent, and we get a, either evidence of another killer or someone else confesses. But I think based on a few facts we know, this is what happened. And I'll lay out some of those facts, and you guys can judge for yourself. One thing we know is that Adnan told multiple people about a conversation he and Hay had where Hay attempted to get back together with him, where Hay asked him to go to prom, and he said no. He told her, no, I'm fine with our relationship the way it is. I think both Alice and I indicated we think, like many lies, there was some truth to that lie. That conversation was had, but it was the opposite of what Adnan said. I think that morning he made an effort to get into Hay's car. I think he asked her for a ride. I think she said yes, but I actually think it's possible that Becky is right. That what Becky heard when Hay told Adnan she had something else to do was real. But I think what Hay was doing was making up an excuse. And I base this, and this is a little bit of a stretch, but I base this on Hay's behavior at lunch. We talked about this. One of her other friends, it might even have been Becky, said that they saw Hay in the lunchroom and she seemed wistful. And they asked her, what are you thinking about? And she said, Dawn. And we kind of flippantly interpreted that back in our first episodes as she was sort of daydreaming about Dawn. But I wonder if that's actually what it was. I wonder if Hay was feeling a little guilty. She's in love with Dawn. She's in a very sort of, for her, serious relationship with him. And yet she's still doing things with and for her her former boyfriend, Adnan. And I kind of wonder if at lunch she felt a little guilty about that. And I wonder if after lunch she told Adnan, you know what, I'm not going to be able to take you. But I also wonder if Adnan, being charming and convincing, convinced her that she was his only option. His car was in the shop and he needed her help. And at some point she decided, okay, I will take you. It's also possible, as we said earlier, that Becky just got the story wrong. And in fact, she was always going to take Adnan. But I think by the time school let out that day, she was going to take him. We'll talk about the 236 call. The police and the prosecution thought this was the come get me call at Best Buy. I think this call was more likely either a call to Jay, a sort of get ready call, or possibly a call saying, hey, I am going to be at the Best Buy at a certain time because I think Adnan always intended to take Hay to the Best Buy and always knew that he would need a ride from the Best Buy, however things went, because Hay was going to have to go get her cousin. So there's that call. It's possible that Jay leaves shortly after that, as we've talked about before. If you look at the pings, after this call, Jay moves slightly to the west, away from Jen's house. And I think at one point, Jay even says the second call, the one from Adnan, who's now at the Best Buy, he was driving at the time. So I think that would be consistent with that. That's a little unclear. We can't know that for sure. But I think at some point, there's an indication, hey, come to the Best Buy. I think it's also possible that this call happened at the library. You know, we talked a lot about Asia's letters. I kind of think Asia's telling the truth. I realize that's controversial. A lot of people think she's lying. I kind of think she's telling the truth. I just don't think it's that significant in the grand scheme of things. At that point, I think Adnan gets into the car with hey, and I think he drives. I think this was not that unusual for Adnan. Adnan was in her car a lot. There are fingerprints in the car. We didn't even talk about that much because the fact that Adnan's fingerprints are in the car probably isn't all that significant. Adnan was in her car all the time. But I think at this point, Adnan is driving her car. I think he had told her, hey, I need to take, I need to drive to the shop, then I'll jump out, you can get in your car, you can go get your cousin. I think instead, he took her to a place that was very special to both of them. Very special to both of them. A place where they had a lot of good memories. I think he took her to the Best Buy, not necessarily because it was a secluded place to murder someone, but because it was a place filled with positive memories. Alice and I talked about this at the very beginning. Adnan is full of romantic gestures. And I think he thought this one would work. And I think at that time, he asked her to go to prom with him. 
And I think she said no. I think Adnan got mad. Uh, that what exactly happened at that point is hard to say. You can imagine him asking her why. Maybe he asked. Maybe he asks her about Dawn. Maybe here. Yeah, I'll take a drink. <laughs> maybe he asks her if she and Dawn are having sex. At some point, Adnan from the driver's seat lunges at Hay. She hits her head on the door the passenger side door as he forces her back, which would be consistent with the autopsy report and the head trauma that you see. He begins to strangle her and she kicks up and hits the windshield wiper bar, knocking it off of the steering column, but she can't escape. And her attempt to tell Adnan she is sorry, do not stop him. He kills her. And at that point, maybe he pulls down the seats in the back, which open up to the trunk and roll and, and rolls her body into the trunk. Maybe he gets out, sees no one is looking, it's secluded, and quickly moves her into the trunk. Either way, at that point, he either calls Jay or waits on him, and the cover up is on. And there is one piece of evidence that when I saw it made me stop what I was doing and crystallized this entire theory for me. And this happens sometimes in a case. Sometimes in a case, you come across something and you just think, wow. And the wow moment for me was a photograph of the back of Hayes' car. And in that photograph is a picture of a map book. It's a map book that Hay often kept in the driver's side pocket of her car. The map is open. And in fact, Adnan's fingerprints will be found on that map. Removed from the map book is a page showing Leakin Park. But that's not what got me. It's what's sitting on the map book. It is described in the police inventory report as a rose and baby's breath wrapped. Adnan's prints, including his finger and palm print, are found on the floral paper wrapped around the rose and the baby's breath. And that rose is sitting on the open map book. What was the big moment for their relationship? There are two of them. Junior prom. And when Adnan went out and bought a single rose and brought it to class and gave it to Hay in front of everyone. And it was such a romantic moment. And Hay was blown away by it. And she writes in her diary that she took that rose home and she put it in a vase, the one from the junior prom. I think Adnan thought this was going to be another one of those grand gestures in the Best Buy parking lot where they had had so many loving moments. And he was going to pull that rose out, relive that moment, ask her to go to prom and everything would be okay. It would be back to the way it was supposed to be. And she said no. And when she did that, it enraged him so much that he murdered her. Okay. <clears throat> you ready? All right, Brett. You know, people always ask if we ever disagree. Today might be one of those days. Okay. Because for anyone who thinks that you are too hard on Adnan, that you have your mind made up about Adnan, that he's not as bad of a guy as you've painted him to be. I think that you're actually an incredible softy on him. And here's why. I think we're looking at the same set of facts. And there's a lot of what you said that resonates with me, but I do not think this is a crime of passion whatsoever. I think this was premeditated and Adnan knew exactly what he was going to do if Hay chose the wrong choice. In a lot of ways, that was the rose. She was given a choice, and in his mind, she was the one sealing her own fate. She had one of two choices. Fall back into his arms, not simply take him back, but be, com be completely swooned by him, and fall on her own sword realize her own faults of falling for some silly dawn. This wasn't just a, I'll take you back. It was a, please, Adnan, take me back. It was that or she would die. And here's why I think that. 
So premeditation and crime of passion, like you say, it's a fine line and sometimes it's hard to draw. And really maybe our disagreement is a disagreement of, um, on a spectrum. But I think it's very instructive for those of you who grew up with like the Ten Commandments, who maybe grew up in church or studying, you know, thou shalt not murder. If you've ever been to like a, even a child Sunday school, you've probably heard of the teaching that murder is more than just murder, right? The Bible doesn't just say thou shalt not murder. It says you've even committed murder if you hold anger in your heart against your brother, something like that. And I think that's instructive here because there was a burning anger towards Hay's actions that he felt offended him. And so little by little in his heart, he was harboring murder-like anger towards Hay, probably from about the AIM profile. So for a week, it was building on top of each other. And he even used the language of, I'm going to kill her. She's going to die. And he used much more aggressive language than that. Because I think in his eyes, his eyes were angry with murder. And if it were one day, perhaps he could cool off. But as the week built on and his ego swelled and it swelled and it swelled and he couldn't understand why this time was different than all the other times they broke up, that murderous rage was beginning to blind him. And it was becoming exponential within his heart. That's why we have people saying that he said those words, I'm going to kill her well before the 13th. I think he dreamed of killing her. He was a passionate guy. He took big gestures. And I think we'd all be lying if we didn't at some point fantasize or have some image of our mind of doing something incredibly violent. We are emotional creatures who live out a lot of our fantasies in our minds. And that's where it needs to stay if we're going to exist in this society where there are rules. If you break those rules, you get prosecuted for murder. But all of us have murderous rage at some times. Now, intensify that with a lot of pot smoking and being 17 years old and generally being a very egotistical guy who was on top of the world. He was prom prince. And he'd been able to swoon hay over and over. But all of a sudden, he had lost his superpower. She didn't look at him the same way. So for that week, and it was a long week, a week is long when you're 17, when you're a senior in high school. Each day, it built and it built and it built. That murderous rage was building with him. Hidden. And that fantasy that he was living out in his head of being able to vindicate himself, either, I think there were two fantasies happening. She was going to swoon for him again, or she was going to die because there was no one who could hurt him that way without having to pay for it. This was the just world that existed in Adnan's brain. And there are a couple things. This isn't just trying to read into Adnan's head. There are a couple things from the timeline that make me convinced this was not merely a crime of passion that happened in the car as he was trying for the last time to win her over. And when she said no, he couldn't believe it and he just accidentally killed her. I think he went into that day, the 13th, knowing that she would live if she made the right choice or she would die. There was no other option and he would be the one to end her. And this is because we know that Jay's story has changed over time. But really, honestly, in the scheme of all the cases we've prosecuted, Jay lies just about as much as every other witness that we have. And we've said that before. Jay knew the plan the day before. I don't know whether he believed it or not, but he knew that Adnan had murder on his mind. He may not even have justified it. He being Adnan may not even have justified it as murder because he thought perhaps there was no world in which Hay couldn't choose him. If this was just about getting Hay alone and winning her back over, he did not need to leave his phone or his car with Jay. He thought about it the day before. He made the plan the day before. I think it probably crystallized around that 1145 midnight call to Hay when he was giving her all these chances. And in his mind, he's thinking, you are running out of chances, woman. The last chance is coming tomorrow. 
And so when that last call came, and I think it went down, not that she was begging to get back together with him, but quite the opposite. He probably debased himself for the first time in their relationship to grovel to her. I do think he groveled that day because of the way he described how Hay groveled to him. I don't think he's ever done that before. And when he hit that low bottom, he realized there was no other way out. He had become something other than what he knew himself to be. He didn't even recognize himself. He would never beg a girl to like him. That wasn't Adnan. And so he'd been saying he was going to murder Hay. He didn't really mean it. He kind of did. It was a fantasy, but that fantasy was becoming clear and clear in his mind and no longer living in his head. It was now going to be outside of his body into the reality of the world that he existed in. If he just wanted to get Hay alone to convince her to get back together with him, he did not need to leave his car behind. Okay, fine. Let's say he needed his car as an excuse to get into Hay's car. Leave the car behind. It doesn't need to be with Jay. Someone he says that he doesn't know that well. He could have parked his car somewhere. He could have left his car at home. He could have driven it to a shop and just parked it there for the day, pretending to get an oil change. Why did he leave his phone? The phone that he had gotten the day before. A phone that his parents didn't know about. That Bilal had to get for him and put under Bilal's name to activate that phone and give it to Jay. Jay didn't need his phone if Jay didn't need to be part of a plan to help Adnan escape a crime scene. In fact, it would only help Adnan's case to have his cell phone on himself if he were trying to get back together with Hay. He could be texting her sweet nothings. He could be calling her. He could be calling Nisha to make Hay jealous. He didn't need his phone not to be on his body in order to get alone with Hay. Perhaps the car, but not the phone. He made an elaborate plan to have both the phone and the car be with Jay. Someone he'd never done this with before. And yes, he'd had sex with Hay many times before at the Best Buy. And perhaps in his mind, no matter how this ended, whether she was going to take him back or they had sex, that he needed a ride because she needed to go get her cousin. Except the problem is, by Adnan's own words, he had had sex with Hay in that car in the Best Buy parking lot many times before, and he'd never arranged a ride before. So he'd either gone with Hay to pick up her cousin, or he walked somewhere. Or he arranged a ride with someone who was not the person he thought to arrange it with that day, if it was just going to be like any other day. Instead, he arranged it to be calling someone on a phone he activated the day before who he has never really hung out with before, who doesn't know that well, to come pick him up. And he doesn't call him in a panic. He calls him three times. He calls him. Adnan calls Jay three times to ensure that Jay has the phone, that he can reach him, and that he knows what the plan is, all before the murder is supposed to have happened. Because of all this, I think this falls well into the bucket of premeditation. And so when we can talk about what happened that day, if he was in the library, if he asked, he absolutely asked Hay for a ride. But I think when he got into her car, whether she said she couldn't give him a ride and he smoothed his way into her car, whatever happened, he knew that she was getting a rose and she had two choices. And what was going to happen was up to her. And that's why he's been able to walk around for the last 20 years as if he's done nothing wrong is because in his mind, he thinks that she chose her own fate and he was merely following through with the laws of nature. She had to die. He didn't choose it. She had a choice. And by choosing not Adnan, she was choosing to die. Everything's passive. Nothing was Adnan's fault. And that's why I think he can be someone who has a sterling record in prison. He can be someone who gets on a podcast and is able to win us all over with his boy next door sweetness. Because to this day, he doesn't recognize that he is the one who murdered Hay. Hay was the one who murdered Hay in Adnan's mind. And that's why he is someone I cannot begin to have sympathies for. My level of rage for what he has done to Hay and what he's done to Hay's 
family and the memory of Hay and what he's done to everyone involved in this case. I don't just mean the people who testified at his trial. I mean the people who have spent their lives fighting for his innocence and his freedom. He knows exactly what he's done. But he continues to live in his fantasy land that he is a sterling, white, innocent flower who is the victim of Hayes' decisions. And I don't have a doubt that the conviction was correct beyond a reasonable doubt. I love you, Alice. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> Oh man, I miss you. I miss you in court. <laughs> I miss you too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, truly, uh, everyone watching this, I didn't know what you were going to say at all. I didn't know. I thought you were going to say premeditation, to be honest. This is why we let Alice do the uh, rebuttal closing. <laughs> so, well, well, let me just say, I don't actually disagree with anything you said. I think everything, I think all that's true. I guess the only twist on it, I think he is, I think he was so arrogant and confident that he really thought she was going to, she was going to say yes and come over to him. And so when I, the rage, I guess I'm talking about the rage. I think you're right. I think he had thought about killing her before he'd obviously talked to Jay about it. I think some of it might've been bluster. I think he was building himself up to do that. I think everything you said is hundred percent right about the way he looked at it though. And I think her saying no to him was such a triggering event for him that, that yeah. And, and I would have no, when I say crime of passion, I just, I guess what I'm meaning is that sort of rage that, that you described that came over him in that moment. I think it's like, look, I have no problem with him being convicted for premeditated murder because I think he went into it prepared to kill her if necessary, even if he didn't believe it. You know what I mean? It's sort of hard to describe. Like, I think he had thought about killing her for all the reasons you said, but like, I mean, honestly, and, and, and I think you're right. I am probably more of a, a wimp than you are. I always feel like, man, to kill somebody, you gotta, you gotta be, and I know that's not true. We talk about it all the time. That's not true that you have to be as angry as people think, but I just feel like when she said no to him, man, he became so mad that that was, and it is a strangling crime, very personal crime, very, you know, emotional crime. I mean, it all fits, but yeah, that was, that was beautiful, Alice. That was beautiful. I have, you know, if I we concede, made a movie, I can see the argument. <laughs> No, do not concede. People <laughs> always say we have to disagree. You know, it's almost like if we if a movie were made about this, I would see the week leading up to her murder where, you know, you have like these hazy dream like sequences in your mind. And it's of him strangling her. It's of him stabbing her. It's of him killing her in different ways. That's all in a dream like sequence. But as each day gets closer to the 13th, the, the dream like sequence gets clearer and clearer and clearer until basically like the midnight of the 12th it's as if it were happening already. That's kind of how I see it, right? Like, like the murderous rage was building and it it maybe would have been a crime of passion seven days prior, but by the day that it happened, he absolutely knew what he was going to do, except he was going to give her the decision. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. You know, we got a lot of things we want to talk about about this case that I think, some of which goes into this. It's pretty obvious how we feel about this. I mean, one thing I want to say, because because I want people to have all the different views of this case. You guys know there are a lot of other people who've talked about this case. You've talked about it in even more depth than we have. Obviously, if you disagree with us, or even if you just want to hear sort of the different side, undisclosed, highly rated podcast, three lawyers in that podcast, Robbie Achaudry, who knows Adnan as well as anybody they come to very different conclusions than we do. They look at the evidence in very different ways. I would like to think that a lot of the facts we've, we've said, everybody agrees on does sometimes different people look at things in different ways. Bob Ruff, he, the first series, the first season of his show, truth and justice was called the serial dynasty. He did that on this case. Uh, you know, he reached out to us, was very kind. I, I talked to him about it. As I said to him, sometimes I think this case is kind of like that dress, the dress that was absolutely white and gold that some people saw as blue and black. Like there are people looking at the same dress, but different people see the exact same dress different ways. Sometimes I think this case is a little bit like that. Wanted to point those out to you guys so you can hear them. I mean, they're going to give you a very different view than what we did. You know, one thing I want to say that what I really appreciated about what Alice said 
is this case, you know, I have said before that the most dangerous thing in a man's life is a woman. People think that's controversial. (laughs) Sadly, sadly, the statistics, you know, I've never even batted an eye when you said that because it's so sad that it's true. We see that every day in the statistics that bear out in the victims that we, you know, are trying to vindicate in our prosecutions. And so I know a lot of you like laugh, like, oh, my goodness, Brett's saying something really shocking. It's not shocking at all. And if you think it's shocking, you need to take a real look at some women in your life who may be incredibly vulnerable. Yeah. And that fact goes to something. There is this idea out there that, you know, we we're prosecutors, so we're automatically we're we hate Adnan and we were going to come into this trying to nail him to the wall. And, you know, we're happy about this outcome. I am not happy believing that Adnan Syed killed Heyman Lee. I am not happy believing that the last thing Heyman Lee saw was the same thing that too, too many women see which is someone that they loved and who they thought loved them murdering them. That does not make me happy. It would be, I would much rather think that this was some sort of random crime than to believe that Adnan Syed is capable of doing this. But I, I think when you look at the evidence, this is where it leads, wherever you want it to lead. This is where it leads. Now, look, we've talked about the evidence. If one day it changes, I am happy doing an episode with a mea culpa. If, if, like I said, if the, you know, they find Alonzo Sellers DNA on Hayes shoes and he confesses, I am more than happy to come on here. And I will be very happy to say that Adnan Syed didn't do this, but based on the evidence we have, I don't know how you can say that. And that doesn't make me happy. It makes me very sad because both of these people should have had amazing lives. And because of what Adnan did, both of those lives were taken away. No, I think that's absolutely right. Like I have, you know, I have the high of giving a closing argument like we do in trial. But at the end of the day, you know, when when a verdict is read in our real trials and when a sentence is handed down, I feel no joy whatsoever because we are looking at an incredibly sad situation. A, A lot of young lives were ruined. Same with Adnan, by the way. Right. Like he is an incredible he was an incredibly promising 17 year old. The world was his oyster. There could have been a totally different path where Adnan is this just stellar citizen. He had the potential to be. He was absolutely on the path to be. And we not only lost Hay, we lost Adnan as well because of his actions. He chose that path. But he had the capability of being a contributing member of society. And that makes me incredibly sad because, you know, I. I'm not in this position. I'm not, I didn't become a prosecutor to stick it to the man and, you know, put a bunch of people in prison. Quite the opposite. I wish we didn't have a job at all. And that's why this case makes me so sad. Adnan had every chance to be an amazing citizen, a contributing member of society. And instead, we have how many countless hours and Reddit threads and good people spending countless hours that should be really focused on like wrongful convictions and other people who really need representation instead we're like sitting here talking about cell phone tower pings from a 20 year old case like i hope that we're done with this case because i want to focus our energies on other cases but i think this was important because so much energy has been spent on this case that i we needed to speak up about it And I hope no one else, (laughs) you know, they they can disagree with us. But I hope this kind of at least focus your energies elsewhere now. We have talked about this, you know, ad nauseum. And if I didn't convince you, if we didn't convince you, that's okay. But the evidence isn't going to change at this point. And I think this goes to the, the question of why we covered it at all. And there were a lot of people who asked that because the case has been covered so much. But I think Alice has answered that question. I think both Adnan and Hay deserved it. I mean, I would like to think we bring something different. You know, <laughs> whenever people ask us why we're covering any case, I'm always like, well, I mean, hopefully when you listen to us cover a case, you think it's a little different perspective. And I think we were able to do that. Look, look, we're not the first people to say that we thought Adnan was guilty or anything, though I think the vast majority of people who've covered this have, have number one, come at it from a different perspective, and number two, maybe not 
I mean, I don't want to be critical, but maybe not sort of dug into the details as much as, as we did with some of this. And certainly not with some of the expertise that I think, I hope we bring to it. And so that was one reason we want to do this. Cause I think both Adnan and Hay deserve that kind of coverage. Hay in particular, I mean, Hay deserves justice. And the thing that makes me sad about this case is, is I just, you know, I don't know that. I mean, I, I don't know. I would, the second question this brings up is should Adnan have gotten out? I mean, some people have said, look, he spent 20 years in prison. He was 17 years old. I get all that. The problem I have with this is he still hasn't admitted he did it. If Adnan Syed admitted he did it and expressed some remorse, I would have no problem with him getting out. I would no problem with that at all. You know, I think that would be, I would like to think he's a different person today than he was then. And I think all indications are that he spent the last 20 years in prison becoming a better person. And I hope that if he remains out of prison, he will be a productive member of society. But he needs to admit what he did. And he needs to give Hay and her family that he needs to give them that closure. I don't know how you can believe that Adnan is guilty and yet be fine with things the way they are, no matter how much time he served in prison. Like Al said, it's hard to feel sorry for this guy, right? Particularly when he is re-victimizing Hay and her family every single day. You know, one thing I'll say, and then I don't want to keep talking because I want to hear Alice's brilliant thoughts. I will say this. Right now, this is in the Supreme Court of Maryland. I don't know how that's going to go because the higher up you go in review, the less it becomes about the case itself. I think the Maryland Court of Appeals was really troubled by the way this case was vacated. I think you see that in the way they wrote that opinion. I think you see that in the footnotes. I think they essentially thought this was a fraud on the court, which is what I think it was. I think the whole vacation was completely improper. I think it was an injustice. It was a miscarriage of justice. The problem is that case hangs on such a narrow thread because there are big questions about things that have nothing to do with this case, including standing and victims' rights. And we're going to have to see what the Maryland Supreme Court does because if they only worry about victims' rights and standing, they may go the other way. They may not be as concerned with the facts of the case as the Court of Appeals are. So I don't know what's going to happen there. We'll follow that. We'll obviously follow it with you. But I, if I had to bet on this, and this is going to make some people unhappy, but if I had to bet on this, I would say it would not surprise me if the Maryland Supreme Court decides this case on some narrow standing question and basically says the victims don't have standing to challenge these kind of things. We'll just have to see. Yeah, I think that's, we'll see, you know, this is, this has had such public opinion and I think it's worth noting. I know I kind of just you know, yelled at all of us, including ourselves for spending so much on this case, but I think this case is really important because it does show how powerful public opinion can have on a case. You know, we all cheer for um, the podcasts who get a real wrongful conviction overturned. And I think it's, very important to have people who care about victims, who care about people who are wrongfully convicted, um, to never stop fighting. Absolutely. I think in in this instance, it's just completely misdirected um, on Adnan's case, especially when you lay out all of the evidence, and this is not a close call type of case. Um, and it's honestly disparaging the police at a time when, you know, public opinion of police is not already very high. But to believe this, like, insane frame job is is not helping victims it's not helping other cases um and so i just wish that this type of attention were directed at those who are deserving of the type of attention and we've talked about it before and i'll say it again but cases like temujin kensu um and not on a clear cut case like adnan's one thing I know Alice had mentioned, and we've mentioned this throughout, is a question that I don't know that we can ever really answer, is why Adnan trusted Jay, why Jay helped Adnan. It continues to be the question we probably get asked the most. And, and we've said from the beginning, I don't really know what all went into that. I think we've had some good theories about it, but honestly, that's another one of those questions I feel like only Adnan could really answer. I tend to believe it's that he had known. I mean, look. Stephanie and Jay had been together as boyfriend and girlfriend since like second grade or something. I mean, we talked about it in the first episode, it went way back. And Adnan and Stephanie had been really good friends. So 
you know, at one point, I think Jay says they didn't really start hanging out till the year before this happened. Maybe that's true, but I think they had known each other for a long time. And I think something Alice said way back, I don't even know which episode now, the whole like the boyfriend of your best friend. I mean, Jay had been Stephanie's boyfriend for so long and Adnan had been Stephanie's best friend for so long. And I just think there wasn't anybody else in Adnan's life he could trust about this and he had to have somebody help him. He couldn't pull this off by himself for all the sort of obvious reasons. And, and I think that's why I picked him. And that may not be satisfying to you, but even Jen couldn't give a satisfying answer. And Jen knew Jay as much as anybody. You know, I think the more interesting question is not uh, why did Adnan trust Jay, but rather why did Jay go along with it? That honestly has me more boggled than anything. Um, why did Jay, in essence, trust Adnan? And I think it goes back to probably something that we've talked about earlier. And I, I don't know the answer to this, but I also have to remember that they were teenagers. Even though Jay was, you know, graduated, he was still a teenager. He was still a kid. And I think it was one of those situations where, like, you think of yourself as the criminal element and you never expect yourself to be in that position. But when the world keeps telling you you're nothing more than a criminal, it's almost like, you might as well be a criminal. Um, and I don't think he ever even really believed what was happening, you know, because Adnan was this golden child. And, you know, they talk like, you know, tough guys all the time. Oh, yeah, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill that bee. But for him to actually do that, I, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think everyone is necessarily capable of the type of premeditated murder that Adnan did here. And I don't think Jay necessarily was wired like that either. So when Adnan was speaking in those terms and it was crystallizing in his mind what was going to happen, Jay was still living in the world where we use words loosely. You murder people, you hate people, whatever. And so when Adnan called him and all of a sudden there was a dead girl in a trunk, I truly think that Jay was like, Oh my goodness. Like I, I I can't, I can't even, I can't even think straight right now. This is not a world that I actually believed was going to happen. I thought he was all talk. And what am I supposed to do? Who's going to believe me? Like, it's obviously going to be pinned on me. If I don't do something about this, I have no choice, but to help Adnan cover up this murder. And so, I mean, that's just complete speculation, but Throughout our Adnan series, I've been actually more interested in Jay <laughs> than anything because I think he obviously, whenever you talk about Adnan, you talk about Jay. And I think he has been, you know, he's no he's no Boy Scout, obviously, but I think he has gotten a really short end of the stick with the reinvigorated attention on Adnan's case. Um, and I, you know. I, I don't I don't think he's blameless, nor do I think he was the one who murdered Kate, though. And let me just say about Jay. Jay did a really terrible thing. He did a terrible thing when he helped Adnan bury Hay's body. And, you know, he ended up owning that thing. He pled guilty to it. He was facing prison time. You know, we talked to Jay's lawyer, and she was a really good lawyer, and he was lucky to have her because... When she found out about the way the police had treated him and some of those later interrogations, she made it pretty clear that she was ready to bring some lawsuits against the city of Baltimore for some violations of Jay's rights. And I, she believes, and I think it's probably true, that those threats, one of the reasons that the judge sort of surprised everybody and just gave Jay probation, kind of let it go. And Jay let it go and she let it go. And Jay did his time. And he has moved forward with his life. But I'll tell you one thing Jay did not do that he could have done. It would have been the easiest thing in the world when Serial came out or when Adnan's conviction was vacated for Jay to say, yep, the police forced me to do it. And if he'd have done that, he would have been a hero. He would have written books. You know, he would have he would have been on every show. He could have made so much money off that. And he chose it would have redeemed that. him. Right. Because exactly. he is not a good character in the Adnan Hay story. Right. So he, he could have harassed. He, could have, endlessly. he would have been like a hero and he could have cleared his own name because he's the guy who helped bury Hay. Right. I mean, look, even Asia wrote a book. She's got a book you can buy about her experience. Just think what Jay could have done. And he didn't do it. 
And instead, he said he wasn't going to do anything against Hay. Basically said, whatever Hay's family wanted him to do, if he if they wanted him to talk more, he'd talk more. That was his position. And, <laughs> you know, if Jay was the victim of a police frame job, this would have been a great opportunity for him to say so. And it would have benefited him greatly. And yet he didn't do it. And I give him a lot of credit for that because it would have been the easiest thing in the world. And also, he would have been doing it when public opinion was completely in his mind, right? Public corrupt. There's a there's all this talk about police corruption and and reform in the police force needed. This was around the time that he could have stepped up and said it, and it fit kind of the the public opinion of the time. That may not have necessarily been the public opinion in 1999, but it certainly was when Serial was coming out and then the more recent kind of court activity. And so he would have struck when the iron was hot. His his story would have fallen with like immense praise. There would not have been a, a doubt about his story. He would have been kind of like the leader of a movement if he wanted to be. And that's not what we have here. And and one thing I want to say, because I, I, I coupled them together at the beginning that, you know, we always talk about Jay and we talk about Adnan and vice versa, but they are not the same. And they are not the same because I think just about immediately, Jay admitted what he did wrong. He lied about some stuff. He forgot some stuff. He, you know, he's loose with words, whatever. From the very first time he talked to the police, he owned up to what he did was wrong. Remember when we talked about his statements back then, we were like, why is this guy talking so much? If we were his lawyers, we'd be like, stop it. You are admitting to so many crimes right now. He admitted what he did wrong. To this day, Adnan has not done the same. And because of that, they are not the same. And I think the true hero of this case is Young Lee, who to this day fights for his sister. And, you know, I, I really wish this would work out in a way that would bring justice to Hay. But, you know, my concern has always been that to the extent she's going to get justice, she's already gotten it. And we're just all going to have to deal with what happens next. Because, you know, if I, there's another reason I wish Alice and I weren't right. <laughs> I wouldn't be brokenhearted if we were wrong. Because if... The Maryland Supreme Court upholds the vacation of that conviction. You know, Adnan Syed, I just say this. I question every exoneration list now. If his name's on it, I question every single one. I need to see that. I'm not just going to trust you anymore. If you if you have a sheet of paper that has a bunch of people's names on it and you say these people were exonerated for their crimes and Adnan Syed's name on it, I don't trust you. Like <laughs> That's my position on this. And he's at Georgetown living it up. You know, when this is all finished, if he's exonerated, he's going to be, he might get a bunch of money. He may be, you know, on the talk show circuit. I mean, who knows? You know, we'll have to see his face on innocence documentaries till the end of time. And that's pretty sickening. And it, and it makes me sick for, for Hayes family. Who's also going to have to look at that. The last so, question or no. the last thing I was going to say was something you brought up earlier. Oh, Alice wow. was, yeah, I was did basically Adnan, going to let's go ahead. You, you asked did Adnan get a fair trial? You're just like setting it up for me to spike it. <laughs> so one thing I'm going to ask all of you, if you've hung with us for 14 episodes, you probably know us pretty well by now. And you know the case very well and what happened at trial. You can disagree with us. You can disagree with us with our ultimate conclusion. You can disagree with our theories about parts of it, about part of the evidence. That's great. Go for it. But please do not come with us. Come to us and say, well, yeah, the evidence looks like it's all there. He, he did, probably did it, but I don't think he got a fair trial. Because I think that is that that line now is what people use to shut down conversation. What exactly do you mean he did not get a fair trial? Because we addressed all of the allegations of not a fair trial throughout these 14 episodes. And I think it is actually a fallback for people when they don't want to acknowledge the ultimate conclusion or they disagree with your conclusion. You're welcome to disagree with us. That's fine. People can look at two things. Brett and I looked at, you know, the same facts and come out with two different theories. That's okay. But to simply say, you know, end of conversation, he didn't have a fair trial. In what way? Because this was presented to a jury. You have heard much of what the jury heard. And you need to point to what you think was the miscarriage of justice. And remember, it's a pretty high bar. It's not just strategy calls. 
by the defense attorney of who to call or not to call or what questions to ask and of another follow-up question to ask. That's all strategy. We've talked about how trial is an art form. It is not a math problem. And so with that said, I just plead to you guys, come with me with a real argument, with a real debate, but do not simply say, oh, I don't think he got a free trial. Because I'm all here for a debate about whether it was a fair trial, but for that to be your ultimate conclusion, because you don't want to accept what the conclusion is, I think is a cop out. Yeah, and I blame Sarah Koenig. I'm gonna say her name right because people keep saying I'm adding an N in there, which I am. That's my accent. I cannot say. Koenig I was gonna say that's just without how you saying say it. Koenig. I mean, that's just how I'm gonna say it. So, but I blame her for that because that was her cop out at the end, basically, right? I mean, I've got to think that. I really think by the end of Serial, she probably thought Adnan was guilty. And I remember that last episode and everybody's waiting to see what she would say. And she basically said, oh, you know, I, I don't know. I just think I just think there were, the trial wasn't fair. He didn't get enough. There are more questions like all this stuff. And it was just it was like the first cop out. And people have taken that and ran with it. And you just see it in every case. I mean, every single case that's controversial. People just say. Well, you know, I think Scott Peterson did it, but he didn't get a fair trial. Or, you know, I think Darley Routier did it, but she didn't get a fair trial. Or every single person who's ever been convicted, their attorney was obviously ineffective. And it's like, I mean, no, they weren't. No, they weren't. <laughs> and people talk about Christina Gutierrez and the fact that she was sick. And we, as we said, we've talked to Jay's lawyer and she pointed out that, yeah, she did get sick. She wasn't sick at the time. If anything, she had too many cases. But as we've noted, Everybody else kind of thought this was a long guilty plea. And it would have been so easy for her to spend a half day cross-examining Jay and sit down. The woman, it, she's not ineffective, but she's annoying as everything. I mean, if you've listened to any of, of her questioning, if you've read the transcript, I mean, she just is like a dog with a bone. She didn't give up anything. The reason for the first mistrial, which is kind of funny, you know, there were two trials in this case. The first case mistried because at some point she's going after the prosecution. They're up at the bar and ordinarily the jury's not supposed to hear what you're saying at the bar and they turn on this static so you can't hear it. She's going after the prosecution for something and the prosecution's like, you're saying we didn't tell you this, but we did tell you this. And then the judge says something along the lines of, you know, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to put up with any misrepresentations in my court. You know, no, you're not going to lie about defense counsel or prosecution. And so one of the jurors overhears it and like sends a note to the judge that essentially says something like, now that you've called the defense attorney a liar, does that mean we're going to start over? And then there's like, okay, mistrial. <laughs> and they have to do it again. Right. Almost like a technicality. So, yeah. <laughs> like he like, misspoke. <laughs> exactly. So there may be all sorts of things you don't like about her. She was not ineffective. And the Asia McLean stuff, in my mind, is clearly a strategic decision. And even if it wasn't, it's not presidential enough to overturn his conviction, which is why his conviction wasn't overturned on the basis of Asia McLean. I feel the same way about the, the cell phone stuff. Are there things she could have done? Are there things I would have done different? Absolutely. That's not the standard. So, yeah, this whole, like, didn't get a fair trial thing. I think it's a cop out. I think it's overused. And unfortunately, because it's overused, I think it makes it really hard for people who actually don't get a fair trial to succeed because when judges see it i'm sure they feel the same way i do when i get a brief that comes into my office and says trial went fair i roll my eyes and <laughs> i respond and then move on i think a lot of judges see so much of that now they just they just ignore it and now brett we're entering like the um uh i, I now i'm like back to not getting my words out. Now we're entering, entering like big discussions about how this Adnan series is so much more than about Adnan, right? This is our way of also talking about how there are negative externalities and positive externalities to every case that you cover and the stances that you take because you can't have your cake and eat it too. Every case is a case of police corruption or it's not, you know, we can't live in those worlds. And we are by, by basically standing with Adnan in a case of clear beyond a reasonable doubt for his conviction and standing with him and demanding that, you know, there's this elaborate police corruption or frame job uh, it, and that he's, you know, wrongfully convicted, all of that. What that does is take away from people who are actually sitting in prison, wrongfully convicted. Like, dear God, I hope that is not the case, that there are many of those sitting out there. But 
We know of at least one. And there may be more than that. And their claims are diminished in the sight of public opinion and in the court of law when we hear about these obvious cases like Adnan's, where people waste all of this time, basically all of the capital behind those arguments on, the, on, on cases that are not close calls. And I think it's important to think about it because our cases, even though we've talked about in trial, we've talked about within your case file, you have to stay within the bounds. We talk about this with like 404B, right? We are we are only supposed to look at the facts before us. But in reality, we live in an interconnected world and none of these cases actually stand alone. That's why at sentencing, the judge asks about the recommendation uh, from the prosecutor for the sentence. You know, how does this compare to other similar cases? Because all of our cases do affect each other. The public opinion affects each other. There is kind of... A, a, a capital that you wear out on each of these arguments. And that's important to know because we should all be passionately fighting for, you know, viewpoints that we, we feel, feel strongly about. But don't live in a world where you think those arguments exist in a vacuum. They absolutely affect victims, other defendants who may have viable claims under those arguments. And to, to think that they are not affected, I think, is, is a very foolish way to look at the power of your own words and the power of your own ability to affect change negatively or positively in this realm. Well, Alice, I mean, I agree with you 100%. I have nothing I can add on that. You're just so eloquent. We need you. We need you more. You should come back to the office. Um. We have now been going for two hours. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I did not realize that. Yeah. So You know you're having fun, Wen. <laughs> yeah. I think we have covered just about everything it is possible to cover in this case. I'm sure there someone will immediately prove me wrong on that. But given that we've been going two hours, I do you want to answer a question or do you just sure, want to go ahead? Sure. And... <laughs> why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> People are tired of our voices anyways. We'll do one. We'll do one question. We'll try and end this on a on a light note after we've talked about all the problems <laughs> of the world. Let's see. Okay. Are we gonna break this up or are we gonna let like people listen to a two hour episode? <laughs> oh no, this is one episode. They're getting one Ooh, episode. That's a long episode. <laughs> we did break it up. This is the second episode That's this week. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> um okay. Let's see. Let's see. There's got to be a fun one in here somewhere, not just like. No, there, there are some dark ones, like not not bad questions, just like real dark, kind of like the way we started out this episode. OK, we're going to do this lighthearted. OK, we're going to answer okay, this lighthearted. question lighthearted because it could be like a dark one, but we're not going to. No, lie let's, this is let's, from we Liz. Need some brevity. This is Le from brevity? Liz. Levity. Levity. <laughs> Levity. What is your unpopular opinion? And I will give two. <laughs> Oh, okay. I mean, you've given a lot of unpopular opinions. I've given a lot of unpopular opinions tonight. But Godfather 2, man. Woo. It's terrible. It's not <laughs> terrible. It's great. Just not as good as Godfather. I don't know, man. My first one is pineapple is delicious on pizza. Oh, that and is my second one is all hot dogs should have ketchup. Those are my two <laughs> unpopular opinions that I'm going to offer <laughs> at the end of this. At the end, at the Risk of undermining everything we set up to this point. Those are my two unpopular opinions. Okay. Unpopular opinion. I think every steakhouse should have a room called the Bonatorium where you get to take your T-bone steak, the bone of it, and not worry about having to be proper and eat with a knife and fork. And you get to go there and you get to use your bare hands and gnaw on the best part of a steak, which is like the bone. Oh, I love that. Why is it an unpopular opinion? That sounds like it because be a it is opinion. completely improper. Did you not go to Cotillion? <laughs> no, you're not supposed to eat with your hands in public. Yeah. Well, yeah. okay, I see. So that's why you need the bone, the bone, bonatorium, because it's like a dignified five star steak restaurant. But you get to go to the back, and you don't, you don't have to. You know what? I don't think that people bring a doggy bag home with the steak bone for their dogs i think they bring it home so that they can eat the bone in the privacy of their own home because everybody wants to do it oh look when i eat a steak on the bone my favorite thing to do is to gnaw on the bone i just do it in public <laughs> i'm just like i don't need the bonatorium but i like the idea of a bonatorium so <laughs> that may be unpopular for some people but i love it alice i love it <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Okay. Well, look, this has been heavy, as Marty McFly would say. And this has been long. I will say our next episode, not going to be heavy. It's actually not very <sighs> dense either. It's going okay. to be a, I don't know how it's to describe it. It's going to be fun. It. It's my favorite conspiracy theory. And it involves the moon. Even better. But not landing on it. Boom. So, so you all have to figure that out. <laughs> and, and it's going to be very different from this. Much lighter. Much more fun. Probably not as serious. I'm going to take a, a one episode break from the murder of the mayhem. And then we're getting pretty close to October by the time oh boy <laughs> and then obviously and i just want to point out there are five tuesdays in october this year uh, so five episodes that no one will listen to i do <laughs> want to say as i say every year most of them are just standard true crime episodes that happen to have a little bit to do with october and halloween they're no more murder i mean that's else. that's like absolutely murder <laughs> exactly and and you know we've got We've got some, yes, we have a sort of serial killer, sort of a wanted to be a serial killer. It didn't quite work out for him. We've got a poisoning case. Once again, we're going to be tying these cases into movies. They aren't all going to be, last year we kind of did stories that were made into movies. This one, we're just going to recommend movies that are sort of related or similar to, to the stories we're going to tell. But we're going to tell the stories and they're going to be awesome. Y'all are going to love them, I promise. So... Don't disappear on us in October. I swear to you, 20% lower listenership in October. Maybe it's crazy. Not it's insane. Year. It's you know, insane. <laughs> maybe I'll do like, maybe, oh, maybe we should do this. You know, we've started adding these questions at the end. Maybe we should tell like personal, hilarious life stories at the end of each of them to make people listen to those stories. Exactly. All our best stories are going to be at the end of the October episode. So you, you guys can find out what the streaking story is. Them. There you go. Alice is going to tell it at the end of every October <laughs> episode. I'll, I'll tell a snippet of it. By the end of October, <laughs> I'll have streaked. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we finally finished with this series. We've already told you <sighs> Truth and Justice, Undisclosed. If you're looking for the sort of the opposite conclusion which we've reached, Adnan's story by Rabia Chaudhry. Serial is the OG on this. I think it's worth listening to. It's really enjoyable. I mean, whatever you think about it, I really enjoyed it. You know, I mean, I know a lot of people hate it on both sides, which maybe is a it's, you know, best trait is that people hate it no matter what they think about and on innocence or guilt. So maybe that's a good thing. Um, and then, you know, there's just been so many podcasts that have covered this story. So there's a lot to listen to. If you go to our website, prosecutorspodcast.com, got to have the case file, got to have links to court documents there. This stuff is all out there. This is not one of those cases where you can't find the file. So. Check that out. Read it for yourself. This is going to be it for us on Adnan Syed. We're not planning on doing any follow-ups. If something happens eventually with his court case, we'll probably talk about it on legal briefs, but we are moving on from this case here. we got a lot of interesting cases coming throughout the end of the year, so I hope you guys will listen to that. If you have thoughts about this case and you want to discuss it, the gallery on Facebook is hopping on this, so you can talk about anything you want to. There are plenty of people on there who think out add on is innocent and you can take that position and i promise you you won't be kicked out a lot of people who think he's guilty too so you you know you may get to discuss it vigorously i'll say that but i think it's it's pretty civil at prosecutors pod for all social media and look we have recorded every single one of these episodes with our patreon our patrons we had a couple hundred on 250 or so on for this episode the guys in the chat, y'all have been awesome. We've enjoyed this so much. We did this because it was Adnan, but I think going forward, we're probably going to record just about everything with you guys. So I hope y'all will stick around and thank you so much for all the support you give to the show. Well, Alice, is there anything else you want to say? Any other closing arguments you would like to make before we sign off for tonight? No, just that I'm really glad that we did ultimately go on this journey. I was a little reluctant to go on it, um, but it has been, I've learned a lot, not just about this case, but about kind of our legal system and the court of public opinion as well. So 
as always, Brett, I just love doing these deep dives with you. And so I can't wait for our next one. Yeah. And look, just be kind to each other. Okay. Then I know a lot of people have strong, strong emotions about this case. You don't have to hate each other over this. Like, Let's all be friends coming out of this. That's going to be my my plea to you <laughs> that will follow many deaf ears. Is. Yes, we will. We will not attack. We love vigorous discussion, but that energy that you have is so needed in this space. But direct it towards something productive. Direct it towards a wrongful conviction. Don't direct it at each other. Right. Absolutely. All right. We'll be back next week. Talk about the moon. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Hey.